Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this event. Um, as it said on Ruth's slide there, I'm standing on Giant's head of marketing, so I get to do the fun intro, intro jazzy bit where I introduce yeah. you all. And then Kirsty has to do the proper work, taking you through the five elements system. But it's great to be here. We've um, we've run this event at CMX Connect London. It's great to be here at CMX Connect Ipswich. And it's just great to um, be meeting as many people in the CMX community um, as we can. Um, so I think I'm going to start with a story, if I may. This um, beautiful picture is of the M1 motorway, which uh, those of you who aren't based in the UK and have never been to Ipswich might not know about the M1 motorway, but it's about as pleasant to drive down as that picture suggests. I'm going to take you back to 2010, a time, you know, when coronavirus and lockdowns were, you couldn't even have imagined it here in the UK. And there was one wet weekend in March where a man got into his car and um, decided to take a drive down this motorway. And he took with him um, three mobile phones, three SIM cards, a laptop and a very large thermos full of tea. And he drove down this, this road, the M1 motorway in the UK. Um, and every mile he'd pull over and uh, stop in the, in the hard shoulder, the kind of safety area. And he'd get out and then he, on each of the phones, he'd make a call, text somebody, try to access data. Um, and then it record the results in a spreadsheet that he had on the, on the laptop there with each of the phones, each of the SIM cards, he'd do that. And then he'd get back in his car, drive another mile, pull over again, do the same again. First phone, call, text, data. Second phone, call, text, data. Call for up and down, up and down. And he spent his whole weekend doing this, stopping every mile. What on earth was he doing? Well, he was a member of GifGaf's online community. And uh, GifGaf, for those of you, again, not based in the UK, it was a mobile network that was born with a community at its heart. So the whole business model um, of this mobile phone network was that there were going to be no call centers um, and no stores, but only an online community at the heart of it to both service the customers and also educate the customers about the, about the, the company. And this man, Andy Zero, as his username was, was a member of the GifGaf community, and they were in big trouble. It was six months after launch, and they were having critical network failures everywhere. So people's calls were dropping. Their early customers who'd taken a risk on them were losing out at a very early stage. And it was thanks to this man's work, Andy Zero's work, going up and down the motorway and testing the reception at each of these kind of important points and presenting that data back to the team at the online community, that they were able to send that to the engineering team and they were able to actually locate based on his, um, based on his data where the problem in the network was. And then they were able to fix the problem in the MVNO layer of the, of the kind of master network. And then they got it back on track. Um, so an absolutely incredible, right at the start of this business, a kind of incredible display of how powerful members of the online community could be and the community itself could be for the business. And that's where our founders met at Standing on Giants. So we have Vincent Boone and Robbie Hearn, our co-founders. So Vincent was the head of community uh, in those early days and Robbie was the head of customer experience. And they were so taken by uh, this idea, this the power that they'd kind of uncovered using the online community at GiftGap. They thought, wouldn't this be incredible to do for other businesses? And so that's why they founded Standing on Giants. And uh, that's us. And that's where Kirsty and I are from. So we're about, um, I'd say, eight years old now, seven or eight years old, uh, eight years old. Um, we work with clients across the world, Airbnb, um, globally, Lenovo as well. Uh, we've just launched, if any of you are keen gamers, an amazing community in EMEA for uh, Lenovo Legion. So do check that out. And then we also work with a lot of companies in the UK, Tesco Bank, O2, um, and uh, and many others. So uh, that's us. And ultimately, what the five elements system is, which I'm going to hand over to Kirsty to tell you all about now, was us as a company trying to answer the question, why did this member do what he did? And why do the online communities that we saw build and saw flourish and grow? Why would the members do such amazing things for the business? And how can we turn that into a system that other companies can use and individuals can use to really generate value from their community and not just 
uh, generate engagement, but then integrate it with the business properly. So that there's real value there, mutual value. So that's what Kirsty's going to talk about today. Thank you, Rob. So as Rob mentioned, this five, five element system came out of what we recognized was just a lack of understanding about what it is that's making communities successful and integrated. And we identify that there are five key elements that need to be in place and that need to be working together in order for a community to really succeed. And those elements are purpose, contribution, community owner, community manager and platform. And these are all key in terms of making sure that a community is better integrated with the business. So starting with purpose, and this is really the, the most important one that drives the success of any community. And we define purpose here as being the reason for which something exists or is created. And it may sound obvious, but it's necessary for a community to have a purpose. And it's amazing how many don't have a clear purpose. And this is something that needs to be carefully thought out and planned and also reassessed on a regular basis because business um, focuses and goals change over time and you need to make sure that the purpose of the community is staying in line with what the business is looking to achieve. When companies approach us for help with their existing communities, we often find that part of the issue is that the community is existing in isolation from the rest of the business. So there's nothing that's really tying them together. It's not getting the support that it needs in the business and it's therefore not thriving. Whereas when a community really works and is successful, it's generally because, or partly because there's a community purpose that's linking the community activity with the business goals. And this allows it to be better integrated. It means that there's a clear reason for this community to exist. So when the business is reassessing costs and you know things projects that are currently running they can look at the community and say oh well we know exactly why this is there we can see how it's contributing to our business goals and therefore we need to keep it it's a valuable asset to the business so that's showing us how it's important to have a purpose but what should the purpose actually include well we believe it should have a why a what and a who in order for it to be really clear for both the business and for members. So the why is all around why should members join? What value will they get from joining the community? The what is what are they actually going to do there? What can they do that will benefit both them and you as a business? And lastly, who are the members? Who is it aimed at? Is it aimed at your entire customer base? Is it open to anyone or is it just targeted at a segment of your customer base. And one community that has a good clear purpose that's stated on their homepage, um, and this is one that we're working with, is Airbnb. And they say in their purpose, welcome to a global community of hosts like you, share knowledge, get inspired and meet other hosts who are creating a world where anyone can belong. So the why here is creating a world where anyone can belong. It's giving a reason for joining this community. And this very much fits with their overall brand purpose. It's, there's a clear link there between the community and the brand. The what here is stated as share knowledge, get inspired and meet other hosts. So it's quite clear the types of things they're encouraging members to do there. And lastly, who, it says hosts like you and it, mention, it mentions hosts again um, in the second line. So it's quite clear that it's aimed at hosts as a segment rather than aimed at guests and hosts as such. Another thing to consider when thinking about your purpose is the value that you're looking to generate in your community. And we've identified three main types of value that communities can generate. And they are cost saving value. So this is probably the most common one that we see in communities. And this is generally generated through call deflection. Um, and then a good example here is O2, which through research, they found that they were saving up to three million pounds annually through call deflection, thanks to the community, because so many questions were being answered by other members. They were saving all these costs in their call centers. The second value stream is business growth and revenue. 
So this is generated through the retention and acquisition of customers and also increased engagement on products and services. And so Airbnb is an example of, of this type of value stream as they found that hosts who are members of the community and active in the community, they generate 2.5 times more um, on Airbnb than hosts who aren't part of the community. So it shows how them learning from each other and engaging and learning more about how to be efficient and effective hosts is allowing them to earn more. And lastly, future proofing. So this is a value that's generated through ideation, problem solving, testing, and things like that. And Spotify and uh, GifGaf is also a good example here as they generate hundreds of member-led insights a month on the community. So on to contribution. So what we mean by contribution is the time and effort dedicated by a company to create a collaborative relationship with the community. And collaborative is really the key word here. It's not a one-sided relationship where um, a company is just pushing loads of content onto members. There's got to be some give and take. So that's what we can see here, how the contribution is, is this circular motion of, uh, of both the business contributing to the community and the community contributing back. So they're both contributing for mutual benefit. And examples of what the business could be contributing are things like information, updates, uh, content in general, and members are in their turn contributing insights, ideas, support, they're supporting others, which is what's saving costs potentially for the business. And another example here from Airbnb is a really good example of both the business contribution and the member contribution. So just for some context, this post is, was shared by Laura Chambers, who at the time was very senior in Airbnb. She was head of hosts. And Airbnb had previous to this announced um, some updates in terms of how they were tackling biased reviews on their system. Members shared some feedback about those updates and they had some thoughts about other changes that could, could be made. Airbnb then took on board that feedback and made those changes. And this is her, this is Laura now coming back and thanking members for their feedback on that and explaining the changes that were made based on that feedback. So it's just a really good example of closing the loop and acknowledging the feedback that was shared and letting them know that thanks to that, they've managed to make those changes. We are aware though that contribution isn't the easiest of the elements to get right and to, to implement properly. So we've got a few tips for you in terms of what you can do to, to really make contribution work as, your, as an element. So the first one is to create a content calendar and this is really key for any community to have a content calendar in place where you can schedule content, you can schedule different types of content, different types of projects and things that you can do with your community to get them involved. Have regular check-ins with different teams, but particularly teams like the product team, which could potentially give you some really interesting uh, features that you could mention in the community before they go live, or you could get them involved in, get the community involved in um, in testing things before they're live, the, the more that you can get community involved in different teams in the business, the better. Close the loop. So as we saw in that example, that was a great example of uh, a community that's taken on the business, sorry, that's taken on board some feedback and they've come back to the community to let them know that they've, they've done that. So doing that whenever you can is great. And also if there are any bugs, coming back to the community to let them know that they've been resolved. So just keeping the community informed of, of as much as you can. Community friendly posts is key. So if the marketing team, for example, say to you, we really want you to share this in the community, it's important information about X, Y, Z. It's really key that you, if you're the community manager, look at that post and assess whether the language is the appropriate tone for the community. Because certain things that you may share gladly on social media they won't float very well in the community it's a slightly different crowd you've got customers who are already invested in the company in the community whereas social media is open to everyone so you've just got to think about the the tone and the way you're wording things and also think about how you can involve members so rather than just posting a topic think about asking a question at the end 
to try and encourage people to reply because you're always trying to encourage engagement on anything that you post in the community. And lastly, create an, an environment for peer-to-peer -peer help. So this is particularly relevant if you're a community that's looking to generate the cost saving value. So it's more of a support based community. You need to make sure that members feel able and feel like they've got space to help each other. So if, you, if you're a new community and someone asks a question and you as the community manager jump in straight away and answer it for them, other members aren't going to realize that actually they have the opportunity to help people as well. They'll just assume that you or other staff members will answer questions. So it's really important, particularly in a new community to give members space to help each other before you get involved. So just to end the contribution section, we've got a quote here from Carrie Melissa Jones, who some of you may know or may have heard of. She was one of the original CMX team and is now a, an independent consultant. And she said, you don't have to solve all your members' pain points all at once. You do have to ask yourself, what are we in a unique position to help solve? Ideally, you should invite members into the creation process too, so that they can tell you exactly what they want. So that's a really good summary of what contribution means. It's not just a one-sided relationship. So the third element is community owner. And by this, we mean an employee who holds the principal responsibility for the community within a business. And this is very much an internal facing role. And they're a key part of how a community can be integrated within the business. This person is responsible for networking within the business, being a real advocate for the community and getting the community as involved as they can in other teams. And in terms of who they are as a as a employee, they're often a senior manager and normally in an operational role or customer facing role. They generally are well networked already and they have solid relationships within the business. So that's quite a key part of of what they're doing um, which so in terms of what they do, they are securing and maintaining stakeholder support. That's quite a big part of their job, making sure that they're promoting the community internally. But they also need to be supporting and managing the community team, so the, the community manager and the other people in the community team. And they're also responsible for the community strategy. And that very much has to be in line with the business goals, as we said before. So they're, they're keeping the purpose at the front of their mind all the time and making sure that it's still in line with the business goals and that the community strategy is, is following that same path. And we do find with this role that there are certain things that are a real struggle if this person or this role doesn't exist. So this is something that we'd love to hear from you afterwards um, in terms of whether you have a community owner for your community or if you've, if you've heard of this role, if you think that you've got someone that takes on that responsibility. So do let us know afterwards how that works for your company. Community manager, this is probably the easiest one for everyone here to understand. Uh, so as we know, a community manager is responsible for the day-to-day -day running of a community. And this is more of an external facing role. So as opposed to the community owner who's looking inwards towards the, uh, towards the company and how they can get the community more involved in the company, the community manager is focused on the members and on the community. And they're ensuring that the community activity is contributing to the achievement of the overarching business goals. So in terms of who they are, well, presumably some of you here are community managers and here's a picture of some other CMXs. So this is from a CMX Connect London event. I think it was 2019, Rob, just before um, COVID hit. Um, that makes so me so happy and sad to look at this I picture. Know. Look, this was, this was right before, this was right before the lockdown, wasn't it? This yeah, was it was. Last Probably year. Rob poking above the, uh, yeah. the top of the back. <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like I look quite similar. <laughs> Sorry, brief, brief interruption from me, Kirsty. Carry on. <laughs> uh, so, as in terms of community managers, we know that people who are community managers generally are creative. They're good at dealing with data. They're emotionally intelligent with good communication skills. And when we interviewed Michelle Sims, who you can see at the front there, crouching down who's part of CMX London, 
she said to us that she'd never met a community manager that she didn't like. And we just think that sums up how great community managers are. And in terms of what they do, I mean, there's too many things really to list here in, in terms of a list of responsibilities, but the, just to name a few, they stimulate engagement in the community, they pass on feedback and issues, and they write reports and analyze metrics. So one thing that we've looked at recently is how time can be distributed between different members of a team and where different members of the team should be spending their time. And this came from some work that we did with GIFGAF. And one thing that we've noticed in a few communities is that the head of community often ends up having to do a lot of engagement, a lot of admin, a lot of uh, the moderation type tasks, just because the team is so stretched. And this is very common in community teams that there aren't really enough people to do all the jobs and therefore everyone has to do a bit of everything. The problem is that this then means that the head of community doesn't have enough time to focus on the strategy and the strategic thinking which they would do alongside the community owner. So we believe that ideally the structure of the team should look a bit more like this, where the head of community is only spending maybe 15% of their time actually engaging in the community, but the rest of their time they're spending on strategy, on meetings, on working with the community owner to help make the community more integrated. And thinking just specifically about community managers, and how they they spend their time they will be spending a larger chunk of their time in engaging in on engagement and that's really important and it's important that engagement is prioritized as a task rather than just focusing on the back end moderation type tasks it's important that you're visible that you're um you're encouraging engagement getting members to talk to each other um and this is really what generates the most value but then obviously you still need to to do the admin and the foundation type tasks. So this is things like moderation and welcoming new members and things like that. And then analysis and reporting is also likely to take up a, a good chunk of your time, depending on what your priorities are, what, what your business requires of you in terms of reporting. But generally community managers are doing weekly and monthly and maybe annual, annual reports as well, which can take up a bit of time in order to prepare. And then lastly, meetings are always going to take up a chunk of time and 15% could be a little bit optimistic for your company, depending on how, how many meetings you have. Um, so again, it'd be really interesting to hear from you in the breakout rooms or wherever we meet afterwards to see how much you think this represents your, you know, your distribution of time if you're a community manager, because it may be that this is wildly different to, to how you're currently working. So we'd love to hear from you on that. So the last element then is platform. <laughs> so what was that, Rob? 100% meetings is what mine yeah. is. And then... <laughs> <laughs> it sometimes feels like that, doesn't it? Um, so platform. The platform is not definitely an important element and it's a key part of any community. It needs a platform to live on. But it's not the most important element in our view. It should support you to do your role as a community manager and it should enable members to contribute to your purpose. So it needs to have the right functionalities to allow members to engage in the way that you want them to engage. So, for example, if you're a community that's looking to generate future proofing value, so you're looking to generate some ideas, you need the functionality of people being able to post ideas and potentially vote on them or upvote or downvote them. And maybe you need a separate ideas board as opposed to just um, it being part of the rest of the community. So you need to be thinking about things like that. If you're choosing a platform for a, a new community, these are things that you would consider. You'd also need to look at what data and what metrics you can get from the platform. So there are some platforms that are great with data. They've got loads of different things that you can download, that you can export and, and use, but there are others that are quite limited in terms of the data that you can use from them. So if, again, if you're looking to generate more cost saving value and it's all about support in your community, you may want to be looking at accepted solutions and how how many of your questions are, have accepted solutions or potentially the time to first response. So if these are metrics that you can't measure on your community, that could be problematic. 
So these are, are things just to consider when you're looking at platforms. And just to end, this is uh, the end of the five elements um, that we're going to share with you today. We just got a quote from Darren Goff about platform. And so Darren has worked with us for the past year. And some of you may know him because he often gets involved in CMX events. But he helped to build the Money Saving Expert community, which is a very big community now. It's got almost 2 million members. And he said, every platform will have a long and detailed spec sheet of functionality that often attempts to be all things to all people. Look for a platform that has the features, safety, technical ability, and intelligent design built by a team who run communities for a living. This lived experience will set a platform apart that can deliver sustained growth and user experience over the long term. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're thinking about platforms. And that's it for our presentation. So do feel free to share any questions or thoughts with us here, and then we'd love to hear more from you as well in the discussion rooms. Brilliant. Thank you, Kirsty. We do have a couple of questions. I've decided that I'm question moderator. That's a <laughs> pretty classic uh, me move, isn't it? Just... <laughs> um, so uh, we had a question from Margot. Um, this was when um, you were talking about Airbnb, Kirsty, and that that's, mm -hmm. that's about the members um, earn two and a half times more on Airbnb than non-members. And Margot's asked simply, how do they, um, oh, it's gone. <laughs> uh, she asked, how do they capture the data? Um, which I think, uh, I think I know the answer to, but I'm guessing you do as well. <laughs> Well, I can give part of the answer. I don't know if I know the full. I'll give the part that I understand. So yeah, go for it. We always encourage communities that we set up to have SSO, which is single sign-on, which I'm sure most of you would have heard of. But that allows the login for the business to link up with the logins to the community. So Airbnb, for example, have SSO, which means that in order to log into the community, they log in to their Airbnb profile and that links directly with the community. So it means that any hosts that are in the community, they can they can see that on their on the back end um, on Airbnb side, they can identify which hosts are also in the community because it's all linked to the same system. So that I assume is how they then found that number. I don't know if that's if you're gonna add anything more to that, Rob. No, no, not at all. No, I think that is how they do it. And so when you're looking to do it for your community, Margot, or anyone else here, the key really is just being able to get that one view of the of the customer or the user or the the member so as long as you can link your community to your crm um there's a number of there's a number of different ways to do that but as long as you can see in in the crm whether a customer is the member of the community or not you can then generate reports that show the difference in in value in a number of areas so i hope that answers your question um, next question, Kirsty. So this was from Zed, and this was about contribution. And in your, I think your five, your five kind of top tips for um, for contribution. How do you know which uh, language and tone works best for community? You were talking about finding community appropriate language. How do you know that? Yeah, it's a good question. I think to an extent, it's a bit of trial and error. I think you you learn as a community manager what works well in your community and what doesn't. Uh, so in terms of types of content, at least, that's something you can do with a bit of trial and error. So you'll find that some types of topics you'll post and there'll be no responses, no engagement. And others you'll post and everyone will love it and there'll be loads of good engagement. So in terms of the type of content you're sharing, that's you'd have to just see because each community is different. There are some that love games, there are some that hate games, there are some that love really serious debates about things related to the brand. There are others that don't. So that's how I would uh, think about types of content. But in terms of the, the language and the tone, I think as a community manager, you know your members, you can see how they're talking to each other, how they respond to you. You can identify the type of, uh, the type of language that, that they're used to using and also the type of language that they appreciate from the brand because they'll often discuss announcements that they've seen potentially on social media or they'll talk about posts that, you, if, that you've shared in the past, they may well give feedback on that. But as a general rule in a community, it doesn't, it shouldn't be too formal. You don't want to put the type of press release that you may share as a press release. It can't be that formal. It's got to be, it's got to start with hi, it's got to be a little bit chatty and informal, but also share 
the important information that you need to share. And then, as I mentioned earlier, just always try and have some kind of questions and kind of conversation starter or some even just saying, just let us know your thoughts at the end, just to open it up to encourage people to respond. That's the main the main side. And also just not having not making it too salesy, because that's sometimes that something that happens that you get um, content from other departments, which is just a bit too a bit too salesy. And essentially, you're not trying to sell things to people in the community or trying to get their feedback, or get their ideas or get their comments. So just bear in mind what you're trying to achieve by sharing it in the community, I'd say. I think bad examples are as useful as good examples here, Ziad. So I've, I joined a community of a new startup, which was a, a tool to uh, monitor your carbon footprint. And they started a community, a, a brand owned community separately and um, started off quite well. And then I think after about three four weeks they didn't really know quite what to do and then now just sort of every month there's like once a month now there's a message that's like you know we've launched our new crowdfunding you know like <laughs> you know it's just like a blank kind of the, the same kind of copy that you'd have if they placed an ad in the newspaper you know just like just like an announcement and that really doesn't work and i think kirsty mentioned it but the magic of starting with hi everyone you know <laughs> in a community is quite remarkable yeah. actually even just that little little change like that can help. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I think we've got one more, Kirsty. So James has asked, apart from data, this is good, this is a good one, James. This is a provocative one. <laughs> apart from data, uh, why would I use a community platform? I have membership available on my website by default, and I have social media pages. It's a very good question, and it's completely valid. And it it's it may be that a community platform isn't the right thing for you. It's something that um you have to really look into and to work out whether it does make sense for your the type of community that you're building but what we would say at standing on giants is what you achieve by having a community platform is full ownership of that platform so you're not the heathen to uh facebook changing the setup or changing how people can access your page or things you have full control and you're able to edit and change the design as much as you'd like I mean, some platforms have better um, controls and better ability to personalize your your front front end than others. But essentially, you should be able to brand it as you wish. You you have more access to data, as you mentioned already. Um, and it's in general, it's they're better environments for people to have long, in depth conversations. So social media is great, but often you'll have more shallow, short conversations. Whereas if you are encouraging members to engage with each other, share ideas, have discussions about the brand. They are much easier to take place on a community platform where there's a forum thread design and it's it's just much easier to read and to follow. And there aren't, another thing about social media compared to platforms is that they're, sorry, compared to community platforms is that there are a lot of distractions. And so people may be on your Facebook page, but they'll also be flicking between that and their feed, their messages, their, you know, other companies' adverts and things that are going on on Facebook. So another good thing about having a community platform is that people are choosing to be there and, and purely there. They're not being distracted by everything else that's going on on the other platforms. So that's just mm -hmm. a few things that I can think of off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. No, I think that's, I think that's good. Yeah. Um, I think you covered it there. Um, so we've got a question from Ziad, which was, um, so can you give, can you, can you ask, give examples of uh, a community strategy, like a plan that is executed with predefined queued steps from Ziad? I think what I'm going to say to that Ziad is that would be wonderful if we could give you that in sort of a, a short, less than, less than one hour or, you know, a couple of minutes answer to a question. I think maybe what might be useful, Kirsty, is uh, rather than, rather than all of those, what's the best way to, what are the first steps you should take with the five elements to start putting together a community strategy, do you think? I mean, it's a good question. <laughs> it's quite a big question. Is it, I think it, essentially the purpose is the main thing that you need to work out initially yeah. and all of the other elements kind of fit in after that. Yeah. So once you, once you know why you want to create a community, what that, what that reason for its existence is, then it will be easier for you to work out 
okay, what is the strategy? What are we looking to achieve? What value are we trying to generate? How can we measure that value? Um, and which teams need to be involved? Which What type of contribution can we get from the, the rest of the business? Uh, so I think the, the first thing really is just to work out the purpose and why you why you want this community to exist, what value you, you'd like to generate with it. Definitely. I think everything, I agree, everything flows from there. Who Who's going to come? What are they going to do together? Why do you want it as a business? Why would people join? Mm. Um, and then once you've worked that out, then then you kind of move on to the the, the second element, which is the contribution. Or, you know, what are people going to do there? What are you going to put in as much as what are you going to get out mm-hmm. is a big a big thing. And often what um, businesses forget about, actually, the what you're going to put in to it is very important as well. Yeah. Um, so I'm sorry if that's that's quite an unsatisfactory answer, <laughs> Ziad, because I know it'd be lovely for us to just put up a slide of here's a community strategy, but I think it would be, I think anyone claiming that they can do that is probably lying to you. So I'm just, <laughs> we're just being honest with you here. Um, so James got another question. Um, loving your questions, James, straight to the point. So how on earth do you start a community from a blank page? So from scratch. So James, James, am I right in thinking you were talking about the community of drummers? Is that right? If you just write in the chat and then that would help. Yes, you are. Yeah, good. Um, yeah. So startup, very little engagement, certainly not anything that people would be ready to share in a community space. OK, so, um, yeah. How do you how do you start from square one, really, with a community at the heart? I suppose. How do you get community into the into the business when you're starting just the business as well? <laughs> Kirsty. I mean, that, that is a real challenge. And one one opportunity that you have as a small startup just getting going is that you can build community into your overarching strategy. And that's what we see are often the most successful communities are ones which have been part of the company's journey from the beginning. So GIFGAF is the great example of that. I mean, they started off as a, as a business that knew community was a key part of their strategy. Um, as was Monzo, they very, ma- very much made community a part of their strategy. Uh, and there are more and more startups who are seeing the opportunities of having a community right from the word go. So what you can consider is how you can build your community in the same way that you're building your business and that you get your initial uh, customers or members. You can get them to be the initial uh, core of your community. And if they're particularly engaged, with your business, they can be your, um, you know, your kind of trial members who they understand the situation that it's not yet, you're not yet a big business, there aren't hundreds of customers that they'll be able to chat to, but they can begin to get to know each other, they can form their own small community, even if it's only five people, you can start a community with five people as long as they are engaged and they chat to each other. And then it just can really grow from there, the more customers you get, the more people you can can bring into this community and maybe you would start it on a on a free platform or on social media a facebook group or something just to see if you can begin to get people to engage with each other and then perhaps from there you could move to having a community platform down the line but i think yeah i mean as you say techies love talking to each other i think you would you would find people that would engage with each other even on any subject i mean as long as people are passionate about something they'll chat to each other it's just finding finding those points of conversation that can get them going and introducing them to each other, I think, is the, the important thing. Yeah. Yes, I think that covers it. And uh, Kirsty did cover it, but I would say, James, just rethink, rethink the numbers and, you know, uh, you know, social media, it's very with social media, it's very easy for us to get very tied to vanity metrics and think that unless we have a thousand members, 10,000 members, 500,000 members, a million, you know, then it's not, it's not worthwhile. But what Kirsty said about, especially for you as a startup, if you want to embed community at the start, just those first few loyal customers are going to be incredibly value, valuable for you. Even if, imagine if you want to, you know, release updates to your products or your services, and you've just got this small group of passionate drummers who want to do that with you, you know, that's really valuable for you. Mm. Um We've got one here from Geraldine. Uh, what are the best communities you belong to and why? <laughs> Ooh. Uh, so I'm not in actually many communities, but I enjoy using the Spotify community because I'm a big Spotify fan. So whenever I've got a uh, a music question or a question about 
you know issues with Spotify I'll go on the community um it's also just quite fun in terms of people sharing good playlists and sharing good good music um I also go on the Monzo one sometimes as well again because they have some interesting conversations and it's it's a very engaged community which I enjoy looking at um I don't know what how about you Rob I was just trying to think. So I've got quite into my local areas Facebook group world recently. <laughs> and uh, I so I live in Ealing in West London and I'm trying to sell my flat. And I shared it on LinkedIn, actually. Um, but there was um, there was a one weekend I shared my flat listing on the local Facebook groups. And you saw the right move kind of views do this absolutely enormous spike when I did that and then kind of dip back down and go over again so there was a mini case study of the power of uh, power of communities um i've just joined the what three words community as well um what three words for those of you who don't know it's a brilliant startup that um they're coming up with a new way to create addresses for the world so they've split the whole world into three by three meter squares and every square has a name a three word name thus what three words and so anywhere in the world, even if you're in the middle of a field, has an address. Um, and it's absolutely amazing. Obviously works all over the world as well. And they've just launched a community, um, which I'm looking forward to being a member of as well. Um, and I'm also in a community for my building, which has been good recently for uh, collective action when we're trying to fight our service charge. <laughs> so that's, that's some good ones. Uh, we've got a question from Margot. What are your best practices for engaging more traditionally introverted communities, Kirsty? Um, specifically online, um, for example, uh, tech talent. Interesting. So I actually think that whether you're introvert or introverted or extroverted, the barriers do, I tend to find they, they disappear a little bit in online communities. Um, I think people, a lot of introverts feel more confident to to mix with other people and chat to other people on online communities. So I don't, I wouldn't say I, I notice a big difference between who's introverted and who's extroverted on, on online communities. I think there are definitely people who are more reluctant to engage publicly. They may be more confident chatting to the community manager and in private discussions. So it's maybe, I mean, there are definitely people that you need to get to know privately and just encourage them gently before trying to get them to post in a community because it's it's quite a big step for people to um to go from just registering to introducing themselves or posting so i would say as a community manager reach out privately to members as much as you can especially when they when they've just registered welcome them in a private welcome message and just you know open yourself up to a conversation so just ask them how they're getting on uh, and you'll find that there'll be some people that will, will that will respond to you, but they won't post in the community. So then you can get to know them and you can encourage them and uh, find out what they're interested in and maybe direct them to conversations that that could interest them. And then gradually, the more confident they'll feel with what's going on in the community, the more they get to know other people, they may feel willing to then begin to engage as well. But I think the best thing to do is just find out what they're interested in and then you can create content that appeals to them as well. Definitely. Yeah. Well, I think the, the power of the DM is a, is a thing. <laughs> um, definitely. Um, I thought I'd share, share that funny story from gift Gap as well, Kirsty, which is Toby, one of our consultants. And I suppose the point I'm making here is every member will have their thing that they care about and will talk about. <laughs> And there was one member who apparently was being quite disruptive. So it wasn't that he wasn't engaging, but just the way he was engaging was not was not right. It was disruptive and some other members were getting annoyed with him um, and he was using quite bad language. And because he used quite bad language, they had this brilliant idea of messaging him privately and asking if he could help um, come up with a list of words to test their swear filter. <laughs> so he then he then. <laughs> took this on with <laughs> great aplomb apparently <laughs> came up with a long list of the most weird and wonderful swear words you could ever think of <laughs> and they could test the platform's swear filter and but that was a great way for them to harness that member you know exactly what a great way to engage him ruth i agree <laughs> you know and i think there will be there will be that thing that every member is will want to talk to you about and contribute positively so have a think about how you can turn any negative behaviors into positives. Mm. Um, <laughs> yeah. Cool. So I think that's it for the 
uh, questions. Thank you very much, everyone. I don't know whether Ruth, you want to come back up on stage and uh, take charge again. Take charge sounds very grand, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, um, what we're going to do now is just hop into uh, breakout groups for uh, about fifteen minutes, I guess. Um, and it's an opportunity to get to know each other because obviously when you first come in, there's no um, audio or video. And what we usually do is just a quick round of who you are and what your involvement is with community. And usually we have like an icebreaker question. So today I was thinking why community matters to you might be an interesting one to get the conversations going. And then just see where the conversation takes you. You can talk about things we've talked about in the um, in the talk or things that are alive for you in your community and yeah see how it goes and then we'll come back into this session and just have a quick wrap up wrap up before we we close the meetup down so what i'm going to do is just pop us into groups so bear with me a sec while i make the technology work <laughs> 